All right, back again. This time we're going to talk about Herbert Marcuse's essay on repressive tolerance, which was a re someone recommended this, and I thought, why not? Short, we can blast through this pretty easily. Uh, but before then, a few things to say. Uh, this can now be found on Spotify. I was having problems getting my podcast up there, but now it's there. So you can find these on Spotify going forward. Um, also, you can find it on iTunes or wherever else, you know, there are links below. Uh, you can also follow me at or on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. Um, you can find me on Patreon, of course, with the link down below. Uh, and I'd like to thank Amrit Anshul Boz, Honrik James, John Eust, Julio, Killswitch, Matt, and Paul, who have all been really helpful in keeping this going. Now, given everything that's going on in the world right now, most specifically in the West with uh, Black Lives Matter, if you thought, hey, I'd like to contribute to me, maybe consider even not doing that. Throw, throw a few dollars at the people that need it most, those people that are organizing uh, movements in the streets. That would be really fantastic uh, if you did that, because I don't need I certainly don't need money as much as those those people so please consider doing that certainly before helping me uh is that it i think that's it without further ado then herbert marcuse's repressive tolerance which is kind of topical he's a, he's an old dead white guy so that's a problem but like it, it you know in this context but what he's saying here i think it, it's it's good um for him, tolerance today means being satisfied with the present conditions, which are he hegemonic. They are oppressive and they are repressive. They not only control our bodies, they control our urges and desires. So while we applaud tolerance as being, you know, the hallmark of acceptance and maybe multiculturalism of, you know, a kind of cosmopolitanism, he says that we need intolerance to challenge the oppression that goes on today. We need to say, no, we need to say, this is not acceptable. So he takes aim at tolerance. And I think that this essay might come in a longer form that's called, that he calls a critique of pure tolerance. So he's critiquing tolerance here by saying that it's just become a kind of passive condition accepted by people who, you know, just want to, follow the go with the go with the motions flow with the motions why is that going through the motions what people who just want to go with the flow they don't want to criticize anything they just want to go along for the ride or be along for the ride and this he calls a kind of passive intolerance or sorry a passive tolerance passive tolerance where we just accept the world as it is and we accept all the evils of it as is and the way that we do that, or why we do that, is because we earnestly, in many cases, believe that the system delivers the goods. The system makes us happy. This system that we have, this late capitalist, patriarchal, white-centered, you know, heteronormative, monogamous, you know, can go on and on, system we have is the best one we can ever have. And therefore, we must just be complacent. And we often forget that the only reason we enjoy these relative benefits to what people might have experienced in the past, at some points in the past, um, is because people took to the streets and said, we are not going to work seven days a week, we are not going to work six days a week, which people still do to this day, to make, just to make ends meet. But these things came about, these relative progressions, these relative improvements came about through intolerance by being able to say, no, I am not satisfied with that. So because we believe that the system is good, that we must have faith in it, we applaud passive tolerance because we see that as maintaining the system itself. So we celebrate it. You know, it's everything we watch is about passive tolerance we very rarely see things in which the system is challenged. We instead take our, our obsession with, uh, with true crime, 
or with murder mysteries, which turn every single issue into an individual anomalous instantiation and not a broad systemic thing. And that is because it's so much easier to think of these very uh, small movements and there, we we blow them up and, and they are so much more interesting because they are anomalies to a system that we have for some reason come to accept and believe to be highly um, high, highly operational, one that is totally perfect. So these, these kind of anomalies then look that much brighter. They stand out that much more. So in a repressive society like the one we are in, and Marcuse would have been writing this, I guess, ah, shoot, I don't know, probably in the late 50s or probably the early 60s, uh, he says that in a repressive society like ours, our tolerant political outlets like voting, letter writing, the protests that we often have, uh, maintain rather than challenge the system. So they are kind of like pressure valves so that people don't, they, people feel like they have some kind of a voice in this vacuous system as though uh, there's actually no one listening. So good tolerance for him, these are his words, is tolerance Tolerance is an end in itself only when it is truly universal, practiced by the rulers as well as the ruled. Now, for Marcuse, we'd want to do away with this idea of rulers, these ideas of rulers and the ruled, because that is, you know, just the maintenance of the system itself. And so he, he taxonomizes or he splits up repressive tolerance into two camps. So there is the one we've already discussed, which is passive tolerance, which essentially maintains the status quo. And that is us, um, you know, not me, but people who live in like the, you know, they're suburban big houses and don't, you know, they don't participate in any kind of political activism. They just go with the flow. They don't question anything. And this, I'm obviously, I'm obviously generalizing. Not everyone does this, uh, and people do it out of the suburbs too. I'm just using that as the kind of archetypal place in which no political action takes place. I cannot think of a time when there was a rally that broke out in some, you know, suburban <laughs> county or something like that. You, that just doesn't, it doesn't happen. So that's the first kind of form of repressive tolerance, passive tolerance. The second is what he calls active tolerance, which is extending tolerance in a nonpartisan way to like Nazis, for example. So the, these are your freedom of speech people that are like, oh, we must accept hearing like Nazis speak or hearing, you know, extremely uh, violent people speak just because we need to maintain this kind of um, Habermasian, okay, name drop, uh, I'm referring to Jürgen Habermas, who's part of the same group called the Frankfurt School as Herbert Marcuse. And one of Her Jürgen Habermas's ideas is about uh, the public sphere. And what he says is that the public sphere is a place in which individuals come and discuss ideas and it is through that that we can see kind of real effective change come about through the kind of um, perfect communication fostered by this public sphere. So that's kind of what we're seeing here and Marcuse is very critical of it, right? Because he, you know, he doesn't have time for that. He doesn't have time for people who think that like um, certain races are inferior or like naturally inferior or anything like that. Uh, so of course, that's a kind of tolerance that he wants to criticize. And that's the second form of repressive tolerance. So for there to be freedom for him would mean being free among other free people, not not to be free alone. Because that, you know, you can't be free alone because that would imply then that if everyone else is unfree, you're probably participating in their being unfree. And to do this means more than just tolerating repressive institutions. More going further or challenging our passive and active tolerance. 
So what we want to do then is to arrive at a kind of true tolerance. But to do so, we must be able to identify these false tolerances, the passive and active ones, because we want to arrive at a point in which we are liberated, which is one of his kind of key ideas. And I've done a couple of his books on here. I think if you want to know more about Marcuse, um, we have to move beyond false tolerance to arrive at a real tolerance in which people are actually accepted for who they are and they aren't, you know, exploited or turned into cogs of the kind of capitalist machine. So people have to be free to speak who they are. They have to be free to be able to act who they are, which means getting rid of the shackles of, you know, capitalist working life or laboring that alienates us. And this is an idea he builds more, uh, I guess, in a lot more detail in One Dimensional Man, another one of his books, and Eros and Civilization, uh, another one. So it's difficult for us to put this into practice because one of the hallmarks, one of the signature uh, promises of democracy is that it allows people to speak and it allows people to contribute to political life through their, you know, their vote, through rallies and petitions, stuff like that. Now, it makes it, because we have these things, it makes it that much more difficult for us to, you know, to recognize that these are only kind of cosmetic or superficial ways to challenge the system. So in order to do it, we have to get at the very positivity ostensibly promised by democracy so that we can say, hey, while it might appear as though we have all these options, that we have all of these, this kind of potential, there is this kind of rigid underbelly to democracy that maintains capitalist exploitation, that maintains, um, you know, the... Uh, exploitation of new markets that kind of maintains uh you know property relations that maintains the uh, subordination of women in the home and and in working life and so on and, and so forth and he recognizes that you know he's going to be criticized for this because he's challenging democracy and democracy is for all intents and purposes a shining moment in, in human history. It is a very wonderful thing. But that does not mean we cannot be very critical of what else is going on. And as a kind of tidbit of information about Marcuse that I heard from someone who studies Marcuse, I hope it's true or else I'm just lying to all of you. Uh, he used to have a grad student, I think, or some of his students, like sitting outside of his house with, with guns, because he was like threatened so much for being like anti-democracy, anti-American uh, when he was probably teaching at Berkeley or something like that. Uh, and one one thing that this you know this system emphasizes is nonviolence. So the system and what is going on now with all the protests in the United States uh, and and Canada for for that matter. Um, what we see is the system kind of saying, wow, nothing will come of this violence that is being done. Nothing can happen through it. But we might remember a few, I guess, last year, further back than that, um, when peaceful protests were happening by people kneeling in football stadiums, uh, that was not acceptable either. And so we arrive at a kind of uh, an impasse here where it seems like there's no acceptable solution offered by the system itself. So why not be violent? If voices are not going to be heard by people protesting peacefully, then um, there is no reason to think that their voices might not be heard with violence. And I, one of the presidents, I think, once said, like, if you make peaceful revolution impossible you make violent revolution inevitable uh which is a or peaceful protest impossible you make violent protest inevitable something like that which is very a very prescient uh, uh quote one that one that really captures 
the essence of today. So all of this is very ironic, this emphasis on nonviolence, because that's never stopped powerful groups from using violence for its own ends in the past. You know, let's just list them off here. We got drone strikes, we got Abu Ghraib, we got um, Guantanamo, we got, you know, police violence, so on and so forth. So what does it mean to challenge this system? What does it mean? How do we how do we get at it? How do we challenge it? And in a sense, he says that it's a little bit relative in that every age or every kind of moment has its own solution. And we must be privy to that solution at any time. So this solution extends to the kinds of instruments available to us, the tools necessary to undo it. And it seems at this particular historical juncture, what is going on, at least we, you know, we can hope with the current protests and stuff, will mean uh, is the enactment of one such movement or one such effort to undo oppression. Um, but he does say something here that I take I have trouble with. So he says that this this these movements should be essentially spearheaded by in his words everyone in the maturity of his faculties as a human being which is incredibly vague and he doesn't expand upon that at all because i don't know what maturity of faculties as a human being means does that mean someone who has i i just have no idea is it emotional, intellectual, uh, physical maturity? It's um, it's unclear. Um, and I get a little bit wary when we're talking about these things like the human being, like this kind of universal uh, idea, which I worry when we think of this, we instantly have this kind of European model in mind. But he, he tells us that, I'm laying it out here, so if you have more to say on it, I'd like to hear about it in the in the comments. Uh, so this is essentially someone for him, if I had to give a kind of definition, is someone who doesn't fall play fall prey to oppressive desublimation, uh, but that harnesses the power of the intellect to become aware of repression. So someone who, this, I guess this is maturity, you know, someone who. Um, is aware of the way that the world tries to control them. The system controls them. And I would like to say, to define this other term, oppressive desublimation, which is a big term. So let's break it down. Sublimation is the act of um, transferring your desires into socially acceptable uh, actions. So let's say um, you are, have, a, have a lot of libidinal energy, uh, you know, sexual energy that you'd like to have fulfilled, but you can't. So you transfer that into being um, a very productive person at work, for example. So you sublimate that desire, that urge, into something productive. When you desublimate, that means you go back to the roots. You go back to the thing that you wanted um, in the first place. Now, oppressive desublimation would be like if you turn those uh, those desires you had into, you know, consuming copious amounts of like porn, for example, because that is not enacting the thing itself. It's a kind of artificial way that you are so kind of returning to reality. Snap back to reality. Yeah, I, I couldn't resist. Um, and then here, okay, he concludes by highlighting uh, the kind of administered and coded world of economics and politics versus what he calls the free world of culture and tolerance. So this is the, these are the stakes. This is the battle that is going on. And we, we do well to fall on the side of, you know, this kind of maturity, this culture, cultural side, uh, kind of wrapped up with a, with a positive tolerance that is not, you know, acquiescent. That doesn't just give in to the system itself. But yeah, so that's probably pretty short there. Um, if anyone has a problem with what I said, I'd like to hear about it. Uh, and also, please contribute to people 
And if you can't contribute in the form of money, you know, if you can be out with people, that'd be fantastic. If you can protest, if you can, you know, show your support online would be great too. Uh, if you could follow, start listening to uh, black content producers, that is, that would be very good as well. Um, and yeah, at the very minimum, just start listening. But yeah, that's it. Peace out.